Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining another episode of the Educational Leadership Podcast. We have another very special guest, and before we introduce our guest, we want to give a shout out to our spot, our uh, sorry, our co-host first, uh, Corinne French. Yay! I'm so excited to be here today and have another wonderful superintendent that will interview. Yes, every every interview is so unique, and everybody has different experiences and backgrounds, and so it's it's really exciting. Uh, we do want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Ideal Impact. Ideal Impact is giving hundreds of millions of dollars away to public education in the form of a free gift, zero out of pocket to your district. So if your district needs higher teacher salaries or whatever your district may need, whatever your goals of your district are, and you need funding, unrestricted funds, reach out to Ideal Impact. Okay, now we will get to our guest. We have the superintendent of Forest Grove Public Schools in Oklahoma. Superintendent John Smith. Superintendent Smith, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. Uh, very excited about today's interview. Um, for those listening again, if you can just share a little bit about your background. Uh, well, I, I graduated from Oklahoma State University um, a long, long time ago, and <laughs> I, I worked as a uh, I worked as a truancy officer. Um, chasing kids that weren't going to school. That was one of my first jobs out of college. And a friend of mine that I attended high school with asked me to come and teach English because I, I had my certificate. And I told him, I said, man, I don't, I don't want to be a teacher. That's, that's for a different kind of people. And uh, anyway, long story short, he talked me into it. And I started teaching at all, an alternative school um, for at-risk kids. And I enjoyed it. And um, I decided I would prefer to help educate those kids rather than, you know, chase them around, try to get them to come to school. Um, so I did that for eight years and, uh, I got a job here, uh, which is actually in my hometown. This is where I attended elementary school, where my grandmother attended elementary school in the thirties and all of her siblings. So it was, it was really, it's really great. It's great to be here. been here 15 years. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll keep me around. That's so, so when cool. you were oh, sorry go ahead, go ahead no you go ahead you get it. I, was, I just well, thought that was pretty I good. always love asking like the superintendents did you so you told us already you didn't set out to be a teacher but you were certified so there might have been like a little uh hint of it I guess if you got that certification but did you know that you would be superintendent and did you have aspirations early on and can you tell us a little bit about that I'm fascinated with how the pathway yeah. that folks become superintendents no, I ha I have been uh, I've been I've worked in law enforcement. I've been a fireman. Um, I actually worked in television for a while. Um, but no, I did not. <laughs> I, I think that God is. This is my penance for how I treated my teachers. That I will work <laughs> at a school for the rest of my life. No one has ever said that before. <laughs> no, that's a true story. I tell the children when they when I when I was I used to be the superintendent and the principal here, and. Uh, the kids would come to my office because, you know, they had had an issue and made a bad choice. And, and I would tell them, it's okay. You're sitting in a seat that I sat in and you're getting in trouble for the same thing I got in trouble for probably. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but you're, you know, you're still going to have to have some kind of consequence. You know, I will say again that we have unique backgrounds coming in on the pot. Like every, it's so cool. Like hear, hearing the stories of how, you know, everybody started at one place and then they were called or, you know, got tapped on the shoulder or just ended up there as a superintendent. And uh, it's, it's such an important position that has such uh, an influence and impact on so many people, um, you know, the students, but also the community, you know, as, as people you know, graduate and go go out into the, the workforce and that sort of thing. Um, what, what are you passionate about right now in public care? There's a lot going on, right? There's a lot of really good things going on and people don't always hear about all the good things. What, what are you passionate about right now? I think people rarely hear about the good things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about the kids. The kids are, are the same year in and year out. You know, we always have, um, issues with money for lack of a better, you know, I mean, uh, there's always a budget crisis. There's always some kind of crisis. There's always some kind of new tool coming out to teach kids math and English or something like that. But the kids have really haven't changed that much. Um, they're still, you know, joyful to be here and, 
um, it makes it a, a really great place to work. Mm -hmm. I know, I think of it, I was on a school board for a long time in a, a small rural district where my kids attended. And I always think that we all talk about how we think kids have changed so much, but they all want to be loved. They all need a leader. They all, even if they don't think they need a leader, they need, they need a leader. Um, and they're looking for that leadership in us. And it's, it's, I think that that has always been the case. So I like that you said kids haven't changed that much because I think the the core needs of a person when they're that age are, it doesn't matter if it was 20 years ago, 50 years ago in the thirties, like you said, when your grandmother mm -hmm. was in that district, they, everyone needs to be loved and they need to be encouraged and they need someone that sees something in them that they don't see at that moment in time. Right. So I, I really love that. Yeah, it seems like people um, a lot of times forget just the basic human things that we need as as humans, right? And you know, that, yeah, obviously, love's a big part of it. There's um, discipline. There's there's things that you know we, we need to be uh, successful as as human beings. I know there's a lot. There's been a lot of talk about technology, and it's interesting how those discussions kind of vary depending on the size of your school. Like some schools. Uh, for whatever reason, buy into certain things more than others. But for those listening in, if you can just remind, what's the total number of students in your district? 174. 174 students. And so with technology, like kind of where, where's your, what's y'all's position? And do y'all want everybody to have, you know, iPads or no iPad? Because it's interesting to hear the different perspectives on that. Well, I'm glad you asked. And I'm really proud of the fact that all of my students here have a device. Um, from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. And that was something that I wanted to do um, many years back. And, you know, thankfully, when when COVID happened, um, we were able to transition to online learning a lot easier than some of, you know, some of the other folks. And uh, I'd always wanted to be one to one. And I, I got that from another colleague of mine who's since retired. And he, you know, he told me, he said, you know, we have a device for every one of these kids. You know, this is where we're headed. You know, this is not like when we were kids, John, you know, these kids are, are going to learn with these tools, you know, not a chalkboard anymore. And uh, so wrote some grants and, and got some help from some folks and was able to anyway accomplish that and have it for each one of our kids. So it's an option. I still think that you need a teacher in the classroom. I'm not saying that, you know, you need to pop a tablet in front of them. And they're going to learn. but. Um, yeah, it's it's fortunate that everybody here has a device. A device. Have you noticed a difference between like regular textbooks and technology? I mean, or do y'all still use tech textbooks as well? Or um, we do some. We do use some textbooks, um, but I see um, technology becoming more and more affordable. Um, mm -hmm. So, like the like the Chromebook that I was trying to talk to you guys on. Um, it, they don't cost much more than a textbook. Um, mm -hmm. Textbooks are, are the real problem. They're too expensive for, you know, paper textbooks. And uh, like I said, I've been doing this now 15, 16 years. And we always would have that textbook that got dropped in the pond or, you know, rained <laughs> on or whatever, lost on the bus, left at a ball game. And you have to replace sometimes $150, $200 textbook. Well, it's, I mean, that's really what a Chromebook is, a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the software and the, you know, you, you can upload things to it and no, that makes sense. So what's your district's claim to fame? So what, what kind of, uh, mm -hmm. what makes your district stand out versus other districts? Oh man, <laughs> not really a fair question. <laughs> um, hopefully nobody around here close will hear this. I always tell people that I, I want everybody, every school around here to succeed. I just, you know, I, I do have a competitive nature and I do want my school to be the best. And I think we are the best. Um, we have, uh, 11 state championships or state runner ups since we started here. Um, my enrollment has grown from about 60 kids to where we're at right now. Um, 174. Um, the USDA and other folks out there have been really helpful. I have not passed a bond here, but we've been able to make incredible improvements. We have a greenhouse here. We have devices for every student. We've expanded our, our parking area, redone our gym. We've done all kinds of things with, with just 
help, donations, volunteers, and things like that. I have wonderful staff that works here. I can go on and on and on. I mean, this is, if you have a child and you live within driving distance, this is where they should come to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, it, it's always interesting with, uh, you know, some of the smaller districts. It, I, I imagine that's, you guys have a pretty tight knit community there within the district and everybody kind of knows each other and that sort of thing. That's gotta be, that's gotta be a cool experience. I, I think so. I mean, it, it, it really made it nice for me when I was a student here. Um, I thought I got a good education. Um, and I think that our students are getting a good education. And when students graduate, do they typically stay in the, in that kind of area, you know, of y'all's, of y'all's community or are they, are they moving more out to, uh, you know, what's it, what's that look like? It varies. I mean, it really, really is just a, there's a smattering of kids that, you know, go on to high school and college. There are some that go to work here. We have a lot of uh, farms and ranches in my community in, you know, Forest Grove proper, but uh, there are a lot of kids around here that, you know, we have a really great vocational uh, technology center. So we have kids that do welding, industrial tech, things like that when, you know, after they move on to high school, we have a huge ag program at the local high schools um, that surround me. And so it just really varies. I mean, I, you know, for myself, I have one child that went to uh, Oklahoma uh, University, and then I have a son who's a welder. I mean, and it's kind of like that, you know, they, there mm-hmm. are a lot of opportunities. Um, if they want to stay here, they can work at, you know, Warehouse or IP, Huber, um tyson you know we have a a lot of industry here too very cool very cool yeah um so oh okay yeah that's right i I, sorry i I lost my train of thought there um what any lessons learned through this process that you want to share with those listening in you know because because obviously you are doing a lot of great things you have some great things in place within your district you're growing you have the technology you have the support from the community um, you're winning state championships as, as you've been a uh, superintendent, what are some of the lessons learned that, you know, maybe a superintendent that's, that's just starting in a district or, you know, just s- some, some aha moments that you've had in your career there. Um, well, I'll steal something from, uh, Stephen Crawford. When I was in my, uh, baby superintendent class, they call it. As a first-year superintendent, you're required to, to attend a class to learn how to do this job. And one of the things that Stephen said, he goes, you know, you'll you'll encounter lots of obstacles, pitfalls. You know, you'll have, you know, uh, good things happen, bad things happen. But you'll have people that you will make unhappy, um, and you will not please everyone. But he said, try to remember that uh, as long as you are making your decision in the best interest of the child, then you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And it, he really put it that simply. And and that's that's true. I mean, you <clears throat> there are lots of things you have to deal with, good and bad. You will not make everyone happy. COVID, I, for myself, I can tell you uh, that was a real proving ground for me. Um, half the people were mad at me one day. The other half were mad at me the next, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. no matter how much I tried to, you know, do the right thing. But I do, in the end, think I made the right decision for the kids. And mm-hmm. that's that's all you can do. It doesn't really matter um, what everybody else thinks. You know, we're a service industry, um, but we serve the child and their families mm-hmm. in that order. Mm-hmm. That was a question. That was very similar to the question I was going to ask you. I think when you're a superintendent, there is no way to make everyone happy. But if the focus is on the students um, first and that then you will make decisions that are going to be right because that's, I think, some of the beauty with the local control of a district is you know your students. And if you were an urban district or if you were a district and you take the, and you, if we, if you got plopped into a huge urban area and you take those same principles, it works. That kind of leadership, you could, you can use that in other places. And I think when you learn those things, um, and, and you have, it helps when those tough times come. Um, that, so that my, my similar question was, um, what advice do you have for people who are going to go through another crisis? I hope we never go through the same kind of a crisis again, like COVID, but we will. There'll be other things that are going to be, maybe not to that same level, and the, but there will be other things that divide a community. 
it's it's going to happen with other things. It just it just a, so. What kind of advice do you have for for leadership in crisis, just in general, leading in crisis? I think the best advice that I could give somebody is to, you know, take care of yourself. Try mm-hmm. not to take all of it home, and remember that you you can only do the best you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's and it's okay to not. Um, don't go home and, and cause yourself a aneurysm or have a heart mm-hmm. attack because you live and breathe only that. And the, it can really easily get that way. But that's the best advice I give, especially mm-hmm. a, a new person is don't take it all home with you. Mm-hmm. And it, it sounds cliched because I'm, I know I've been told that myself mm-hmm. and it will come as you, I used to be a much more nervous and worryful person the first two or three years I was doing this job. Um, so I suppose that just comes with experience, you know, and probably age that you, you will learn that, you know, like you said, this too shall pass and we will have another hurdle coming, you know, <laughs> coming down the trail. There will be something else. When I started in, in 2008, it was the budget. You know, everybody was talking about the budget crisis, crisis, everything was crashing. And how are we ever going to get enough money for schools? And, and, uh, my principal at the time, He told me, he said, well, he said, you know, uh, there'll be something else. You know, I said, well, we, we finally got through this, you know, we'll, we'll enjoy some good years down the road. You know, when I get closer to retirement, you know, maybe, you know, my, my last years will be, will be brighter than my, my first years. And he said, well, he said, you know, there's, it's kind of like, you know, running the hurdle race, you know, you, you get over one, Hey, great. You didn't fall. What if the next one's coming, the next one's Mm -hmm. coming. So he said, you just have to kind of (laughs) keep, be ready for that. Don't, don't dread it, but be ready I, for it. I love that. I always like, I end up tearing up every time we do a podcast because I, I love people and I love leaders so much. And I think that was such good advice about not taking it home to be a superintendent. It is a lifestyle. It really is. A board member can call you anytime. It's a different role. I mean, I, I like I mentioned, I was on the board for a long time and my superintendent, the more I got to know him, the more I respected him. I was on the board with him for 10 years and, and it is a lifestyle. It really is. And so that's really good advice for all of the, our listeners that might be encouraging superintendents or board members out there, or even superintendents. If you're one right now, I'm sure there's going to be someone listening and you're taking things home too much. Like, like take a step back because we need you. We need you to stay in these roles. We need you to be healthy. We need to be taking care of yourselves. And and um, I, so I appreciate that, John. That's really good advice. Well, I appreciate you serving on a school board for 10 years. That's a <laughs> that's a payless, thankless job many, many times. And I know that, you know, my board members get cornered up at Walmart or at church <laughs> or wherever. And they say, well, tell me about what happened in this. And tell me, can you tell me about that? And, you know, I hope you did the same thing. They just mm-hmm. did. Well, have you talked to Mr. Smith about it? That's it. <laughs> let, me, let me refer you to Mr. Smith. And that's what I tell them to do. If you, if you encounter that, you know, if, you know, people know you're on the school board They're you know, they try to get that insider information from somebody Mm -hmm. because for whatever reason, they'll be afraid to come in and talk to me, which is really the only way they're going to get the answer. Mm -hmm. I know it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange setup actually like board, board governance and leadership because we're elected, but we're not paid and we're really not, we're trustees, not representatives. We're trustees. So it's a, it's a I, I, that's a topic I love to discuss. I think it's really important for new trustees to meet with the superintendent, find out his leadership style and how they want to go about things. Because, uh, and there's ways to make that happen in an easier way. We lots of districts have a matrix, a communications matrix, where where board members will spread. You know, when you get a question about the new bus route or new this, or you put it on, and then the superintendent or someone answers it, and not the board. Now, there's so there's ways to not get cornered at Walmart. <laughs> Um, like, you know, like here, here's, here's the email that you asked that question, you know, but, um, oh my gosh, I think superintendents, that's why this podcast is so much fun for me. Y'all are truly some of the best leaders on the planet. And I, I just, I appreciate that so much. Um, I know Gary probably, I know we have, we probably are running short on time. So I'll let, I have a final question, but I'll, I'll see what Gary, some of the Gary's are also. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and yes, we're, we're just about at the top of the 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 podcast here. Um, just curious, anybody else in Oklahoma that's a superintendent that you would recommend coming on the podcast and sharing their story? Yeah, I mean, I would I would probably recommend every one of the guys around here. The first one that comes to mind would be uh, um, at Denison. His name is Stacy Ebert, mm-hmm. and it's E B E R T. 
Okay. He's a dentist in public schools. And uh, Harvey Brumley, who's at Holly Creek Public Schools. I'll be on it. I, I, we love, we love hearing the stories of, of how y'all go about it. Um, your journey, how you approach things, how you grow and change. Also, I, I love that. So for, for folks that will, can be listening, it's, it's never too late to start a new career. Also, like it doesn't matter our backgrounds. And, and I, I think there are going to be people who, um, who listen to our podcast and like, you know what? I, I, I've been a board member for a while. Maybe I'll go into the classroom or, or whatever. And I think that's important for people to see that we don't have to stick with one thing. Uh, we can grow also as we're growing these children. So yeah. Is this part of the show where I can put that out there, advertise for everybody? Yes. Else? We need teachers in Oklahoma. <laughs> you no matter start. what you're doing, if you're, <laughs> if you're working at Walmart or if you're a policeman or you you too can be a teacher. Yes, absolutely. It is. That need to be shared. Yes, absolutely it is. And I think we had a guest on a few weeks ago who has a, a program of, of a certifying um, um, paraprofessionals. And it's a, a, a impressive way to certify paraprofessionals. And I just, I think that's what we need. We need people to be out of the box thinking differently. How can we get people? Because if, if, that's, a, if that's a barrier, if the education piece is a barrier, if the financial piece is a barrier, um, and there's something holding people back, sometimes it's confidence. And so for sure, um, uh, whatever, wherever you're at, if you're listening or you know someone that you think would be good in the classroom, I think that's also the thing to do is is let someone know, like, hey, did you ever think about being in the classroom? Because sometimes people don't see themselves in those roles and we need to encourage them. Yeah, absolutely. There are, you know, in, including me, you know, I did not think, well, 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 I don't want to be a teacher. Why would I want to be a teacher? Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, it's a, it was a very enjoyable experience. And I'm so glad, mm -hmm. you know, I, I owe my friend Dustin a, you know, a, a debt for talking me into doing it mm -hmm. many years ago. Well, I bet my final question was going to be what book or something, is there some book or quote that you've been reading or it's been on your mind getting you through the last couple of months or years, or it could be any, anything. Just, I love to hear, I love to hear people's one-liners or if there's a, uh, a core value that gets them through <laughs> no not not really anything red or anything but like my friends you know some of the guys that i was telling you about like harvey um like stacy you know when we run into challenges where we just keep saying hey hang in there brother hang mm -hmm. in there hang in there yeah <laughs> hey it. simple is good yeah mm -hmm. that's good that works yeah yeah it's amazing how how much just a little encouragement from a from a friend or colleague can, can help mm -hmm. kind of just, you know, keep things going. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast today as our guest. And uh, we hope to have you on again in the future and just, you know, keep track of the progress and the great things that are happening at your district. Um, we'll go ahead and, and close out today. So for those that, they, that have been tuning in, Stay tuned for future episodes, and we do want to give a final shout out to our sponsor, Ideal Impact. Ideal Impact's given hundreds of millions of dollars to public education uh, around the U.S. Right? I don't know if I said Texas earlier. They've 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 helped out quite a bit in Texas, but they're actually helping out around the U.S. now. So if your district needs unrestricted funds to use for teacher salaries or whatever it may be, reach out to Ideal Impact and stay tuned for future episodes of the Educational Leadership Podcast.